annual post-budget panel discussion. And this is being brought to you by the Trinidad and Tobago Chamber of Industry and Commerce. Yesterday, $58 billion expenditure profile was presented before the nation. The largest ever diversification, food security, our ability to feed ourselves, to grow sufficient produce, food prices, the removal of VAT, all of that is tied in to a comprehensive plan that the government hopes to see a reduction in the import bill. Was it enough? Mr. Brooks, diversification in the agriculture sector. I think over the years, Hima, we have paid token acknowledgement of agriculture. Um, there is the intent, but I'm not sure it's matched by the spend. When one takes a look at agriculture, agriculture spend, I think, is $1.9 billion <coughs> approximately. It has not had the benefit of a substantial increase, and our food import bill is approximately $4 billion. The minister and the government, I think, have announced that we want to have that by 2016, going from $4 to $2 billion. The only way we're going to do that is by really being very transformative. I think that the step in terms of VAT removal on, on all items is a useful temporary step, mm -hmm. and I think that the move in terms of NAMDEF coup, both from a stabilization fund standpoint, both in terms of supply and pricing, is particularly important given the adverse drought conditions in the U.S. But I think we have to have a far more aggressive approach to agriculture and a far more deliberate approach to agriculture if we're going to make a dent in it. Things, for example, like pre and it has to be addressed. Two you've got to bring in people working in the agricultural sector so that my own view is that around CPEP you have to have a strong migration from CPEP into agriculture. We've got to strengthen the agri-processing area and develop community-based organizations or communities where that produce is moved into a company and then moved into agri-processing with the facilities in terms of ship transportation, air transportation to drive it. Also, I'd finally I'd advocate a regional approach. I want to commend the minister on the initiative with Ghana. We await the details, but certainly you have another facility available with Belize where there are large tracts of land. So food security really has got to be addressed at a regional level where you have the land, where you have the capital, where you have the labor, and then we come to some common arrangements around that. Alignment to the agriculture sector, taking it primary, secondary, and tertiary are processing. Is it enough? I think we have to, to determine, you know, what is, what can we produce? What are we capable of producing? What is our, what is our natural resource, isn't it? I agree with Jared, it needs to be integrated as a region because certain regions, even within the Caribbean, can produce different, different materials. Um, the, the issue of the food import bill that Jerry spoke about is key and as long as we got to see that there's a bridging situation, so we got to see the investment for the long term. But we understand that the food, that the VAT off of food, the zero rating on food, has to be a temporary measure, has to be a bridge. It can't be just an entitlement that we get food VAT free because the, company, the country needs revenue. And, and taking VAT off of food creates a major problem for manufacturers where we pay VAT in our inputs. And in that case, we need to make sure that the VAT refund system and reform of the VAT refund system is critical because we have manufacturers out there waiting two years Right. at times to get their money back. It's almost incentive to go overseas, import everything, I mean, just import the finished product and pay zero VAT. So we've got to look at it. We have no problem with anything that would assist the, the populace and the population in lowering their food bill. However, very critical that the manufacturers can stay in business, keep operating. It's a cash flow drain. It's a cost of finance. So when you take VAT off, you say, well, the food should come down by 15%. But the manufacturers now need to calculate into their pricing structure a cost of finance for having those funds out for an inordinate amount of time that we're not sure what it is. Again, predictability. If we knew it was three months, what is the three months? And what we're looking for is we have major penalties and major fines and interest if we don't pay our VAT on time. Yet the government gets away with not refunding us on, with our money on time penalty. Well, I say with a very tiny penalty. VAT, the BIR system, collection, the ability to cannot deal with all of the leakage in the system. Looking at our revenue stream, Mr. Brooks, are you satisfied that the budget really addressed the deficiency between revenue and expenditure? Well, several points in that. One is that I, I'm not convinced, Hema, that we in Trinidad and Tobago have the capacity to spend $58.4 billion. That is number one. Two, there's an efficiency argument around that. Thirdly, I think we've got to get our revenue up, and I don't think we've done enough um, on the revenue side. 
And the last time I was in the program, I spoke about the lease operatorships. The minister has addressed the issue of lease operatorships, which I think is useful. You have the gas availability issue in point leases, where you have several plants in methanol and in ammonia not producing at nameplate capacity. If you, can, if you can put in place a supplemental agreement with the swing gas producers, it certainly offers the opportunity to generate another six or $700 million in revenue. So there are some immediate revenue ideas that I think are available to us. I just want to just uh, come back to one point that Nicholas made on the manufacturing sector. Today, the manufacturing sector is investing huge sums in ERP, Enterprise Resource Planning Systems, which is IT software to make you best of breed. The markets to which we are going are no longer the Caribbean markets. Those markets are under stress. In Green Leader today, they've prorogued Parliament. Unemployment is 30%. The OECS remittances and tourism is down. Um, so that we have to go to non-traditional markets. And the only way we're going to be able to do that is not only by having competitive plant and equipment, but by two things. One, the industrial relations climate, and secondly, by investment in software, which gives us inventory management systems, <laughs> supply chain systems, marketing systems. In some cases, those systems cost 50 to $60 million. And my suggestion is, and my recommendation is, we should be getting an initial capital allowance on the investment in ERP systems, because that is what makes us competitive. In terms of the industrial relations front we've got to get back to competitiveness mm -hmm. and we've got to get back to productivity and in my respectful view the industrial relations act needs to be overhauled because we have to ensure that we have the right feedstock in terms of attitude a constructive collaborative dialogue to so that we are able to focus on productivity things like absenteeism we need to reduce I'm going to stop there because clearly you, you no, that would have yeah. been one of my questions about a productive labor force and I see even this morning Michael Anistad is here presenting uh, getting that social compact looking at the uh, ranking Barbados was able to achieve. Some say it's our Dutch disease, it is the curse of our natural resources, but we have yet to get everyone on the same page. Whether we call it Dutch disease, which is well defined, or whether we call it uh, a, a determination around productivity and competitiveness, it requires a mature dialogue, a consensus, and a coming together. Why should we have a teacher's strike in the first week of the term when one had two months to sit during the August vacation and resolve it? Why do we have agreements which are coming to the, which at the end of the triennium are still, still persistent? Clearly, there has, some, there has to be some capacity building. You have, I want to go back to the point of revamping the Industrial Relations Act. The right to strike, in my respectful view, should be by secret ballot. Because you have occasions in which people do not want to strike, but they're intimidated. The, the certification and decertification. If a union does not represent 51% of the membership, there should be a consideration of decertification. In Canada, that's the process. Right. You have frivolous actions. I dismiss someone, company X dismisses someone for valid reasons. The, the employee still takes it to court, and there's no award, of course, for frivolous actions. So you really do need a revamping of the Industrial Relations Act. But more importantly, you need a constructive, collaborative approach, public, private, um, and the labor to come together. Public, private, and labor, can it occur? We just have about a minute again, so we'll wrap this interview. Your closing comments, Mr. Logjack, how are you going to measure the successes and the failures of this budget? Firstly, let me just touch on a point that, that Jerry made there with respect to the deficit budget. And I think that we have to be thankful that our, our treasury and our balance sheet of the country is in such a strong position that we can afford to run a, a deficit budget for a, for a couple of years. And I don't have a, we don't have an issue with running a deficit budget as long as we are productive. Right. You know, we have, uh, I think it was 46% of GDP. Germany's running at 80-something percent of GDP, but they are productive. If a train comes in, says 12.01, 12.01, it pulls in. You know, everything runs very efficiently. Um, our arteries, our roads, everything needs to be upgraded and made. What's my outlook for the budget? I, I, again, as everybody has echoed in all, the, all the, the different panels and shows is implementation. That's going to be the key thing, and perhaps midterm updates as to where ministries are, and so the population can keep accountability on the, on the different agencies. Similar comments. One, accountability. Each minister must use the budget opportunity to account for what his ministry has done. Two, um, we have to be transformative, which means that in midterm, both politically and from an economic perspective, now is the time to make some defining change because our fiscal space is reducing. Thirdly, we have got to strengthen governance across the state enterprise sector and across the ministry sector. Communicate, communicate, communicate. Um, those would be my words. So accountability, be transformative, drive governance. And the final word is we have to be careful to prioritize the number of things we are doing. 
we have to prioritize the number of projects we are doing and sequence them. Prioritizing and sequencing. I know that I said I was fine, but really looking at government's priority for this budget, do you think that it was in the right place? I think would you have shifted anything around? I would have probably emphasized a bit more energy, a bit more diversification. Um, I think that what the government now needs to do is to take a step back and say we have announced a raft of projects, which ones really can be accomplished in 2013 and what do we defer to 2014? And in 2013, what are the milestones we're hoping to achieve via each ministry and each state enterprise? So there's accountability, there's a midterm assessment and put in place a unit in government which goes in and re which reviews projects and which says this is where you are in terms of spend, this is where you are in terms of accomplishment. This is where you are in terms of spend, this is where you are in terms of accomplishment. Can we really do it? The public sector